I think the Gettysburg Address is a part of the DNA of all Americans. That's how impactful that piece has been. Among all the statements of what democracy is about, the Gettysburg Address comes as close as any to stating it succinctly, welcoming people of all sorts and conditions into political life is what democracy is all about. You kind of pull words, phrases from the address that resonate with you. Equality resonates with me. It really, it's a guide for us to say, okay, what else do we need to do? You know, the Greeks have an old saying, pathima, mathima. Pathima, things happen. Mathima, we're supposed to learn from them. And one of the reasons we study history is to try to learn. This is one of the great learning moments for all Americans. President Abraham Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address on November the 19th, 1863. His words echoed across the ridge at Gettysburg and down through the ages, forever etched in time. And when you read it and then you reflect, I mean, you want to cry. I wanted to cry. On the crowded platform that day, not far from the president, sat a 12-year-old boy named Willie Curtin. He was there with his father, Pennsylvania Governor Andrew Gregg Curtin. The picture shows Andrew Gregg Curtin and William Curtin looking at Lincoln as he gives the address. Lincoln is hatless and people can figure out where he is, not so much by his face, but by where everybody is directionally looking. The discovery of Willie Curtin in the crowd at Gettysburg is one of the most exciting photographic discoveries of, of the 20th century. Two individuals helped bring to life Willie Curtin's front row seat to history, Josephine Cobb and an apprentice photographer from Baltimore, David Backrack. The early photographers were kind of pioneers. And when he went into the business, it was 20 years after the inception of photography. David Backrack was just 18 when he captured the one known image of President Lincoln on the platform at Gettysburg. You had to paint a glass with, with chemicals, and then you had to put it in the camera, and as soon as you took it, you had to develop it. And so the fact that they were able to get these incredible photographs is kind of a miracle in a way. Had it not been for Josephine Cobb, the head of the still picture branch at National Archives, Bachrach's photograph may never have been properly identified. In 1952, Miss Cobb enlarged a square inch of a glass plate negative in the Matthew Brady collection, and from the tenfold blow up, she and her colleagues determined that this was indeed a photograph of the president at Gettysburg. I am very pleased to have known the woman who made the discovery, Josephine Cobb, and she was a dear friend of my father's and his mother's. Philip's great-grandfather, Frederick Hill Meserve, also played a pivotal role in the preserving of these moments. He was one of the great American collectors of President Lincoln's photographic images after acquiring several thousand negatives of Matthew Brady's portraits. And at the time my great-grandfather began his scholarship I think the number of known images was somewhere less than 50. Uh, by the time he finished his work, it was over 100. From his collection, Meserve would provide sculptors Daniel Chester French and Gutzon Borglum the images used in their creations at the Lincoln Memorial and at Mount Rushmore. Quite a marvelous man. He lived to age 96, having been born the year Lincoln was shot in 1865, and I knew him as a boy. From his position on the platform, Willie would come to understand the story of how this day came about and the role his father played in making it happen. You're witnessing the speaking of a deep truth that is, in a sense, rearranging the nervous system of the country. 
And so to be as a parent listening to that and having your child there with you, it's like you stand uh, in a sense between the future and the present moment, and it's powerful. His father's leadership among the loyal governors of the North had been established by his early and steadfast support of President Lincoln. Four days before the Confederates firing on Fort Sumter, the federal fort in South Carolina, President Lincoln dashed off a note to Governor Curtin anticipating the opening salvo to the Civil War. My dear sir, I think the necessity of being ready increases. Look to it. Yours truly, Abraham Lincoln. When the firing on Fort Sumter happened and when Virginia seceded, Washington, D.C. was literally on the battlefront. It, right across the river was the, was the enemy. And so Lincoln puts in a call for northern troops. The first troops that arrive are troops from Pennsylvania. And it's this spirit of 76 that embodies Lincoln, Curtin, and the tens of thousands of Union soldiers who are going to commit themselves in this massive struggle. Governor Curtin convened the Loyal Wartime Governors Conference held just months before Gettysburg at Altoona, a railroad hub located in Blair County, Pennsylvania. It was his idea. He got a couple governors to go with him for the invitation, but he saw a need for the morale for the North. There they will discuss the future of the Northern war effort, but perhaps most importantly, the recently released preliminary version of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. The Lincoln-Curtin relationship would take a dramatic turn a few months after the conference. Two years into the war, over a quarter of a million Americans had lost their lives. The largest and bloodiest battle took place at Gettysburg in early July. A few years after the battle, an oil painting captured the intensity and it was shocking. Pennsylvania artist Peter Frederick Rothermal had taken his commission seriously. Rothermel did his homework. He went out to the battlefield uh, and interviewed people who were at the battle, interviewed people in the town of Gettysburg. He really wanted to make sure that the canvas and the images on the canvas were very accurate. You get a sense of the immensity of what was going on. And when was that painted? So soon after. The fact that this was considered historical almost immediately. Governor Curtin, revered as a friend of the soldier, went to Gettysburg in the days following the battle. And what he saw really made him physically sick. There are nearly 7,000 dead laying on the battlefield, buried in temporary shallow graves. Also at the hospital site surrounding the town of Gettysburg, every farm, every little stream bed, every little corner of a garden was a cemetery. The Army wasn't able to necessarily take care of them as well as they would have liked because they were still campaigning. Governor Curtin wanted to make sure those, those soldiers were honored properly. It was Curtin's images of war that compelled him to create a final resting place for those who had died at Gettysburg. He believes that it doesn't show very well upon a nation that doesn't honor its war dead, that's trying to help preserve this fragile idea known as union and democracy. Testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. That's the question, that's the test. He wants to answer, yes. People will say, prove it. He points to the cemetery. There's all the proof you need. Gettysburg attorney David Wills carried out much of the planning for the cemetery, and it was decided that renowned speaker Edward Everett keynote the event. He's kind of like the rock star of the 1860s. He's one of the 
best known, most accomplished people living in the United States at that time. Minister to the Court of St. James, that is the ambassador to Great Britain, assistant and then acting Secretary of State, Senator from Massachusetts, elected four times the governor of Massachusetts. Nevertheless, it's as a public speaker that Everett was known. Wills was instructed to write the president and invite him to speak at the ceremony. What must he have thought, this man who had made his reputation as an orator, as the center of attention? He was ready, he was primed to give a major address, but he wasn't asked to give a major address. It was not a certainty that Lincoln would accept the invitation. It wasn't appropriate in those days for a president to give public speeches. Gettysburg was a huge exception, and it was two and a half years into his presidency. The constant reminder of the ever-present war followed the president wherever he ventured around Washington. He and his family spent their summer months residing in a cottage three miles north of the White House. And at the end of the workday, the president would leave on horseback or in a carriage for the cottage. It's tempting to think of the cottage here as a sanctuary for the Lincolns, that they were in some way getting away from the war and the chaos in downtown DC, but that actually couldn't be further from the truth. In addition to the cannonading that Lincoln can hear from nearby battles and the wounded soldiers that he's seeing in caravans as he's making that commute, and the First National Cemetery is just a couple hundred yards away and would have been visible from Lincoln's front door during that time. So clearly, his time here was influential in developing that Gettysburg Address. Lincoln boarded a special train on November the 18th to deliver his few appropriate remarks. To him, there's a bright line that can be drawn between the 4th of July, 1776, and the proposition that all men are created equal, and the defense of that proposition, 4th of July, 1863. People from far and wide joined him on this pilgrimage to Gettysburg. One lady walked all the way from Hanover, Pennsylvania to be here for the dedication. A distance of almost 15 miles, she walked to be here to see this special event. Trains started to pour into Gettysburg. Generally, we say that 15,000 people attended Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. That evening, David and Jenny Wills hosted a banquet in their home where the president and Edward Everett would be staying. Everyone in the town knew that the president was in that house, and very quickly, a large crowd gathered in front of the house. As Lincoln left the Wills house the morning of November the 19th, it said that he placed his hand on Willie Curtin's head as he passed Willie and other children standing outside the door. That boy is a symbol for all boys and girls whom we want to be instilled with the concept of civic virtue and ensure that this democracy not only survives, but thrives. The time had arrived for Willie to witness history. The great orator, Edward Everett, spoke for two hours. In those days, they expected to be entertained at, at big public events, and it wasn't unusual to have somebody to speak for one or two or three or four hours. Lincoln ended the ceremony with his two-minute speech. And he comes there, of course, to dedicate a cemetery, but he uses this concept and the language of dedication in terms also of the American people rededicating themselves to a cause, to a new birth of freedom. It's a sublime moment in American oratory, in American history, in American presidential leadership. It's a redefinition of the Civil War. It's a rededication of the country to a wider arc of freedom. It's a concession that there's so much unfinished work, and it's a thing of beauty. And who wouldn't have liked to have heard that voice and seen that moment? Amid this solemn backdrop sat a young boy, surrounded by a moment in time that would come to define and influence our nation for years to come. Out of the ruins of this battle, all of a sudden Lincoln is now projecting what's going to happen from this, where are we going from this? And the nation changes, you know, there are moments in American history where we're a different nation afterwards. I think Abraham Lincoln saw this as an opportunity to really transform America. Keeping in mind that at that time, the United States was the only major power where slavery was still a legal institution. The United States could not 
progress being saddled with this institution of slavery. By the time Lincoln returned to Washington the next day, he and Everett had exchanged letters of respect and admiration. Everett famously writes to Lincoln, would that in two hours I was able to accomplish what you had done in two minutes. The same day, Lincoln writes from the executive mansion, oh, we each did what we accomplished, and I'm just thankful, thinking that he's writing to the great order of the age, that you found my remarks to be satisfactory, essentially. In the years after the dedication, several commemorative events were held to observe the significance of the Battle of Gettysburg and the President's Gettysburg Address. One took place on July the 4th, 1865, at the laying of the cornerstone of the monument in the Soldiers' National Cemetery. David Wills read a letter from President Andrew Johnson. Our flag floats in every breeze, and the only barrier to our national progress, human slavery, is forever at an end. I trust you will not forget the thousands of whites as well as blacks whom the war has emancipated, who will hail this 4th of July with a delight which no previous declaration of independence ever gave them. President Johnson was right. The Civil War freed whites as well as blacks and freed the society to move toward giving everybody the opportunity to burgeon out all there is within them. Over July the 4th in 1913, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania hosted the 50th year reunion, and a film from that era titled United at Gettysburg dramatized the event. You had former Union Confederate soldiers, many of them who were veterans of the Battle of Gettysburg, walking side by side and arm in arm around this battlefield. They felt there was something special here. They felt there was a special love and a special bond between them. It didn't matter what the uniform color was. Most of the 50,000 Union and Confederate veterans were eager to attend. One man I know um, who was elderly and kind of sickly, his children had actually locked him in his bedroom to prevent him from coming to Gettysburg. He climbed out the window down the trellis with his bag and came to Gettysburg. Nothing was going to stop him from coming here. Willie Curtin also attended this 50th year commemoration. President Woodrow Wilson spoke. They're the ones who wanted the Eternal Light Peace Memorial, which is today on Oak Hill, just on the north side of the battlefield. The flame burns eternal as a symbol that never again will this nation be divided by American Civil War. Perhaps Willie reflected on all he had witnessed as a boy. But the Gettysburg Address represents not just those words, but a moment in time. It's a sort of expansive feeling about freedom and truth and struggle and life and death. I hope the commemoration of the Gettysburg Address will be a spur to all of us to make sure that when we say that everybody in this country has the right to vote and express him or herself and, and be active politically, that we really mean it. Even the memorial, which honors the memory of our 16th president and the address, has special significance to our democracy, particularly with respect to two individuals, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and 1930s opera star Marian Anderson. The Daughters of American Revolution denied to Marian Anderson to sing in Independence Hall. They decided that she was not worthy. Happily, President Roosevelt intervened, and instead of Independence Hall, he offered the Lincoln Memorial. And in announcing that decision to the Daughters of the American Revolution, he started his speech addressing them as fellow immigrants. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today. King begins his talk with a reference to Lincoln. He's able to say why we're here, 
because of this man behind me. We're here in his, in his shadow, and we're going to talk about what the rightness is of our being at this place at this time. I think in many ways what Abraham Lincoln was trying to do is realize that this is a struggle to make democracy more perfect. In that sense, they were similar to Martin Luther King, where he was saying we need to get beyond the individual. We need to look at, at America. We need to look at ourselves. To sit and stand in a place in history where so much has changed as a result of that symbolism, it's just a powerful landmark in so many ways to me. Willie will forever be tied to an address and a place that continues to inspire. The spirit of the Gettysburg Address is as impressive as the beautiful words are. It doesn't matter what your political party is. If, if this thing is of the people and by the people and for the people, that is government, democratic ideals are there. The words heard by Willie Curtin have been passed down with devotion from generation to generation. I still think the most powerful thought and most timeless thought in the entire speech is this idea that there is unfinished work. These ideas of liberty and equality were clearly very important. And when I think about those values and our nation today and the idea of a nation unified by those values, I think there's a lot of unfinished business. Well, at the time of Gettysburg, the fabric of our country's society was in fact torn. We were in the midst of a civil war. Today, the polarization that we see and comment on so much represents a, a stretching of that fabric. But I think some of the same messages, to stay focused on the future, the common good, are messages that we could stand to hear today. But Lincoln's speech left us with the enduring beacon of a nation conceived in liberty, dedicated to the principle that all men are created equal. Those words, with all their poetry and purpose, define in simple language what it means to be a citizen and an American. All of us would do well to at least read the Gettysburg Address or listen to it, not so much out of a historical interest and what he was trying to say about his time but what those words have to say to us about our time, how it is each of our individual responsibility as citizens to take increased devotion to realizing those values. These values are, are obviously very important and that they're foundations of this country and our forefathers, and I think they hold true to immigrants at the turn of the century and immigrants that come into the United States now. I myself am still thinking about. Noted Lincoln scholar and author Gabor Borit observed, the central idea within the Gettysburg Address gives us all the right to rise. The right to rise, I think it was meaningful to Abraham Lincoln himself. Lincoln's call for a new birth of freedom and a rededication to the proposition of equality for all has inspired our country's best hopes and realizations. His address has served also as freedom's wing in the lifting of oppression from the shoulders of people around the world. A large tour bus pulls up to the gates of the cemetery. My colleague and I learn that these are in fact visitors from China. They had taken a long detour to get here because they wanted to see the site where Abraham Lincoln had given the Gettysburg Address. And their translator said, this place has much significance because the Gettysburg Address is the first thing that they learned to read in English. 150 years later, the words stay true to their meaning and keep us dedicated to fulfilling the promise for us all. Four score and seven years ago, our father brought forth 
on this continent. A new nation conceived by liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place. For those who here gave their lives that that nation might live, it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. For these honored dead who take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth.